Hey everyone, I'm Dan, the founder of jazzcomposerspresent.com, an online space where composers, musicians, and listeners come together to celebrate the music we love. We've just completed our first month of live events and we're thrilled with how they turned out. We featured Jim McNeely, Miho Hazama, Scott Ninmer, Florian Hofner, and Chelsea McBride. The artists gave wonderful presentations and the live Q&As with the community were engaging and thought-provoking. Our August events are already off to a great start and we can't wait to see what our guests have in store for the remainder of the month. All our live streams stay in the past event archive for 60 days. Become a premier tier member today to access the archive and participate in our upcoming live streamed events. This highlights video will provide a taste of what our full length events have to offer. Thank you for supporting jazzcomposerspresent.com. So what we're going to do now in the, the next uh, few minutes is look at some sketches that I used in composing three of the movements of the uh, Barefoot Dances Suite. And these sketches are going to um, mostly deal with the small issues, the, the nuts and bolts, the, the pitch issues, rhythmic issues. But there's a few that we're going to look at in, in the beginning that talk more about the, the large scale issues down on the bottom it's a cascades and this is something i got into really quite heavily um where you build these these pyramid kind of structures that's oh so as you you're going down i, I keep a pedal a melodic pedal up in the top and you go down in thirds and you form a minor structure so it's a unison minor third, minor triad, minor seventh chord, minor ninth chord, minor eleventh chord, minor thirteenth, and so forth. And I started playing around with all these ideas. And this is a, a harmonic motive that appears a lot in the piece. Um, in the clip that we just heard on uh, Bob's, Bob's here, um, it appears, that's the first time it appears, and it appears a lot. It's kind of a, one thing I was influenced here by is, um, Paul Clay, the, the Swiss artist, who would use little motives in a lot of his different paintings. There were little visual motives that appeared uh, all the, over the place in, in, uh, in, in different paintings of his. So I thought I'd have these little ideas, these uh, whether they're harmonic or, or melodic or rhythmic motives, that would appear at different places in the different movements. And then down there, number three seed, and the next one starts with trombone and drums, boom, ch, boom, ch. Da, 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 da. So this is my first idea for this trombone and drum beginning. Um, it's also reinforced by the bass and, and the piano just playing the, the, the roots uh, in, in the very beginning. And then down at the very bottom, another, another C, this is the melody, the main melody of the piece. So um, and then flip to the next page and that continues there. So that's my first sketch for the trombone melody. And then, hey, more cascades. That's for, for I might have used them in uh, barefoot dances. I might have used them in another movement. So, um, but the idea is most of this is the linear thing happening in kind of a stream of consciousness. It, um, on, on one of the early uh, PDFs, I, I said one of my influences was James Joyce. Well, it, the stream of consciousness kind of thing where uh, Stephen Dedalus in, in Ulysses is walking along the beach and just he, he's thinking about things in his head and he says, oh, look at the shells on the shore and then, oh, this is happening and this thing smells and just whatever enters your mind, he puts in, in the, the inner dialogue. And so that's, that's the kind of thing here that this line is, there's no real theme, there's no real melody. It's just moving and moving and moving through different kind of the zones. And, um, then Dan, yeah, flip to the next one. Um, we finally get down to uh, one, two, three. It's the fourth system. We start to see some da 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 da. Those are the cascades coming in. So, um, so we had them in movement one. Now we got uh, now they're in movement three, and they're going to appear several other times in, in the piece. So this is my first version of this thing. So uh, now what we might do is go uh, with the computer sketch and uh, see how it all started to play out. 
Um, so uh, we start with, there's the trombone um, melody and the, the rhythm section hits. Now this is a seven staff template that I use uh, all the time when I'm uh, when I'm uh, sketching things out. And uh, sometimes, you know, you can see there are two grand staves there. Um, sometimes those are actual saxophones and brass. More often than not, though, they're just places to put lines. And so I've got seven staves. The one uh, line, the one staff that's fixed is the bass. And it sounds kind of funny, but uh, in a way, the... I write the bass part first. By the time I finish the sketch and I'm ready to go to the score, I, the whole bass part is absolutely complete. And uh, so that's part of the process of the sketching. The, the, the bass part gets written. And also, so if we flip ahead, we've got the, the trombone melody. And then, um, then all of a sudden in, in the second ending at the bottom of the page, that's where the band comes in with this uh, ba da 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 ba da da da, and it, we go on and just kind of slowly scroll through here. So here's the the sketch, pretty much as I had written it on the uh, on the hand copied thing. Now here at uh, in the fourth bar here, bump 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 bump. That's a um, That's another rhythmic and harmonic motive that appears several times in this whole suite. Um, so this is, I think, it's its first appearance in, in the whole thing. Do you have any suggestions to develop a balance and nice orchestration in a big band setting? Um, first thing is you've got to hear a big band play what you've written. That That's key. Um, you know, it, it's... Uh, the The we rely so much on computers and and computers are great for to me for things like counterpoint and 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 so forth but really for balance and uh orchestration you've really got to um hear your music play live hopefully by a pretty good band um you know if it's a not so great student band who's playing out of tune and not playing the parts very well it, it's hard to get a, an idea from that but from a, a pretty decent band um you can start to get an idea uh, and you have to ask with complete honesty you know is this sounding the way i thought it would um and um i think you know th th there are one one thing i think about is this kind of a pyramid of um of density you know you've got open brass are the most dense instrument and then you've got saxophones and then you have maybe muted brass and then uh reed clarinets especially then you've got flutes and then up above there if you're lucky you've got strings so as you go up that pyramid things are getting more and more transparent so um you start to you know, to to expect to um, to voice a chord and have an open trumpet and a flute balance each other. Uh, you know, and this is in a vertical voicing. It's not going to happen because the flute is the flute's going to lose that battle every time. So you have to start to think about the equivalence. Maybe you know uh, it might take uh, two or three woodwinds to have the same kind of uh, strength as, a, as an open brass instrument. But I, I really think, um, yeah, it, it's really, you know, listening to what's being played, does it sound the way you, you want? And then, you know, there's a number of scores that are available now uh, that you can get. And I think looking at scores is essential also to, to this, you know, just seeing how people who are more experienced than you are handling these kinds of issues. All right, and our last question is from Rufus Reed. Uh-oh. Jim, thank you for a great presentation. Do you make a graph of events of a piece before putting your uh, your ideas down? Or how difficult is it to adhere to the graph? Rufus, how you doing? <laughs> um, 
Yeah, sometimes, uh, like I said before, I do sometimes make a, a graph or sometimes it's just a line to show the, the timeline of the piece. Sometimes it's an actual, there's a few things I've written where there's an actual graph that shows the shape of the piece. Now, adhering to it, when the graph suggests a different shape than the normal thing, what, what I call the Ray Wright, you know, when you read inside the score, he analyzed all those arrangements by, by Nestico and Brookmeyer and Thad, and he made the conclusion they all peak at 86% of, you know, through the, the chart. And um, so if I, if I and, and we have, a, I think, a human, we've got a template inside of us where that's a natural kind of way to build a piece, and it builds up and builds up and then finally comes down takes a little bit of time to come down. It's a very natural human thing. But if I try to, if I decide in the beginning, I'm going to write something that has a different shape than that. I once wrote a piece that within about 10 bars reached the climax and then spent six minutes just coming down. The audience never liked that one very much. They kept expecting <laughs> something, you know, where's the, where's the big thing? Well, the big thing happened right, you know, right away. But, um, they, um, my point is sometimes when you when I choose a shape that's different, it's a little difficult to adhere to that because somewhere the inner voice in me is saying, you know, it's about time to build up to the climax. And well, maybe, maybe I've already gotten there two minutes ago and I'm really taking my time to come down. And uh, the, the old inner voice is... Uh, scared and wants me to do it the same way I've been doing it every other time, you know? So you have to tell, it's just like when you play, you know, I'm playing a gig and I'm thinking, how could anybody listen to this piano playing? It's awful. You know, and you have to tell that voice, Hey, just sit on and shut up over there. You know, you can't get rid of it, but you can tell it to go leave me alone for a while. And, and that happens when I'm writing, um, that voice starts saying, you know, it, it ought to do this, it ought to do that. And uh, so, no, no, let me try. I've got to try this way or that way. Let's see how it works out. You know, this, this one time, it doesn't mean I'm always going to be doing it this way. Just, I have to check this out one time. How I was like, you know, trying to able to, uh, put all the numeral like concept to the um, to the composition. So let's take a look at the first chart, the first score. So the first you know uh, numeral row that I wanted to follow was a row four from the numeral chart, which is four eight three yeah four eight three seven two six one five. And then I actually made it this number row as an interval from the one before, I mean, the the, uh, the the note before, and then going to the other note, and then made a, made, made a line within the um, uh, Dorian scale of F sharp minor. So it's just a really such a short amount of time that you can see how the concept goes to the the uh, composition that's how you know i started this idea into the composition now you know you started to put your your numeral chart in your composition then you have to go with that um you can see as the mark card as red that you can see three times of minor chords after that, marked as blue, that you can see minor chord for six times. And then for the uh, dark color, non chord for one. So this is the whole uh, phrase of this section, actually, like three times of major chords, six times of minor chords, and then one time with non-core. Yeah, so this was like a second idea that, okay, maybe I can, you know, put the, the uh, numbers to the uh, harmonic ideas or rhythmic ideas. Um, the last thing that I wanted to work with 
with this concept was a scale. So let's take a look at the numeral chart one more time. Now you're familiar with this now, but let's look at the uh, row two and the row seven. Obviously, row two is going to from left to right, two, four, six, eight, one, three, five, seven. And then row seven is actu actually a retrograde of that. And uh, um, I wanted to use these at the same time so that I can actually expand my perspective to the numeral on even like a numeral chart that uh, I could probably use the row, row, row one, which is just uh, ascending notes from one to eight, as well as the descending note on the row eight from eight descending to one at the same time in a composition. Um, so I started thinking how I could use this. So like now we've used this numeral chart as a part of the uh, uh, concept as an interval, as a harmony, as a rhythm, and then as a scale. And uh, that scale strategy goes to the same strategy for the uh, row one and eight. The same thing, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight as a row one. And then eight, seven, six, five, four, three, one, two, the retrograde of row one as um, uh, row eight. That uh, we also wanted to keep using that as a part of the interval. So then the last part of this section is going to be uh, using the uh, the same sc uh, scale of F sharp minor. Well, F sharp, uh, maybe that's, that's a Dorian scale without it, the um, uh, flat five, something like that. But that's the, uh, the scale that they're using it. And then finally, they're gonna go to the uh, row one and then row eight together. And then that's going to be just the uh, finale of the uh, composition. So overall, what I wanted to do was that I wanted to keep using from the middle of the concept of the numeral chart, which was the row four and five. Maybe we can just actually show the numeral chart. Yes, thank you. So uh, what I wanted to do on this composition was to use the numeral chart from the uh, mm, the middle of the chart, which is row four and the five together, and then row three and the six together, and then row two and the seven together. Finally, go to row one and eight together. In this composition, I uh, figured to make intervals using a row four and a five as a fugue, and then uh, using row three and a six to figure out a new rhythm pattern. And then row two and a seven, also the combination of a row one and a eight to use the uh, scale using this numeral chart. Amunit has a very eclectic instrumentation with strings, okay. horns, and vibraphone. How did you arrive at that insp instrumentation and what inspired that orchestration? That's a very good question. Um, first of all, uh, well, like, you know, dream big. I wanted to have a orchestra, like entire, let's say big orchestra with 75 people. And obviously that's impossible because I didn't really have a money to it. I couldn't afford. Uh, so I couldn't shrink. I mean, I, I should I should have shrink the band, but how? Um, the, the, uh, the main thing that I was thinking at the time was that I can't get rid of the strings because I really hear strings all the time in my head, in my head. My brain sound usually works as a, the a very, very symphonic sound. And I didn't want to ignore that. So I, you know, I, 
I ended up having a string quad at first of all. And then like I tried to have a rhythm section. And then finally tried to have other instrumentation around myself. And then <laughs> the funny thing is that this is probably silly for you, but um, my birthday is November 13th. So <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I set up the uh, number limitation as 11 as a November 11 or 13 as the day of my, you know, date of my birthday and to make an instrumentation. So I tried to make an instrumentation with 11 people and that was not enough for me because I was missing uh, uh, one saxophone and the French horn and something like that. Then, like, you know, I figured it out, okay, maybe with 13 people, that's going to work. And then I tried to make an instrumentation of 13 people. And it somehow worked. So that's how I came up with this instrumentation. Three saxophones, one trumpet, one French horn, four strings. I mean, first violin, second violin, viola, and cello, vibraphone, piano, bass, and the drums. 13 people. That's my favorite number. So were the members of MUNIT aware of the underlying concept? Did you want them to know, or did they perhaps figure it out on their own? That's a good question as well. Um, I basically don't really tell about my, like, uh, a very basic concept about it because it's too practical. And I don't really like to talk about this non-musical concept too much about it before we play it. And I really enjoy, um, you know, people, musicians reacting to the music without knowing what it was actually. And then like, you know, after a bit, then I can probably talk about it, but I don't really want to explain about how, you know, this new more charts is, or like, you know, how that, the, the, uh, 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 that cyclic number order is or whatever, because that's, that's not related to how you enjoy the music. Yeah. So all the clips I've supplied today are, have our jazz pieces for one. Um, some are for smaller groups. Um, there's one for, uh, small jazz ensemble there's one for sort of a wind small wind ensemble um, and then two that are for big band um, concepts that sort of pervade all four of them would be the use of space i've noticed that in all four of these as i've listened to them um, and there's a variety of orchestrations involved and harmonic concepts that i want to touch on uh, but they all have a great sense of motivic development which is something i've been thinking about a lot lately and I've talked about in my mini lessons quite a bit. Um, so that's kind of the overall concepts I want to touch on with these. When developing a motif and extending or contracting it, how do you balance keeping cohesion with the original idea but not keeping things so similar it becomes overly repetitive? Yeah, this is something that I struggled with quite a bit when I was first writing and <laughs> still maybe do a little bit. Um, using ideas too much uh you know you can there's lots of different things you can do to change ideas so there's no reason why it has to be exactly the the same um you know even just transposing an idea a little bit can can bring a fresh take to it so if we go back to the uh to aaron's piece that we heard there when you heard that uh that motor and then the bass line he had like a two bar section there and then he just moved it up a minor third and repeated it again. So you're able to repeat these things um, by just doing a simple transposition, and that helps to to change just something little like fresh. that. Yeah, and also one of the things, like um, I'm thinking of one of his ideas, he just, the full idea comes in later, but then right before that, it's half the idea sounds, and so he doesn't use the whole thing. So yeah. That would be contracting a motive, I guess. But yeah, there's all sorts of different techniques you can have in terms of developing the motives to where you don't, you can progressively get further and further away from the idea without having to repeat it exactly or goes or apply so many different techniques to it to where it's not 
easily discernible that it's been developed from the original motive. When working with set theory, how do you balance the technical rules with making it musically satisfying? Yeah, um, I when I'm tending to work with these sorts of strict uh, theoretical constructs, it's really just a way to get started with a composition. So often I think a lot of composers have the problem of when you first start to sit down to write a piece, if you don't have any parameters, it's really hard to just get the first note on the paper. So I think things like set theory are a way to get the ball rolling. Uh, you don't have to completely conform to any theory. It's just it's just a theory. So um, if there's something where, at least in my opinion, if there's something that you think, oh, I could change this note and it would sound so much better, but it violates the rules I've set down, um, I think it's okay to do that. So yeah, I really just use it as a jumping off point. I might only use it for a part of a piece rather than the whole piece. Um, but ultimately, if I don't like it, I just will scrap it or try to change it into something I like. I really thought about what examples I would want to present today. And, and what I decided to do is to to play a bunch of music from outside the jazz world. So I, I always find it very refreshing to listen to things that are a little bit further away from what we do. And th there's a lot for me to learn there that I can then transfer to, to what we do within the jazz world. Of course, there's lots of great jazz examples that I could have played as well, but that's this, that's what I wanted to talk about today. Different genre, they have a little bit different approach to certain parameters of music. So today, uh, I'll play a lot of examples from contemporary classical music. Can you expand on writing using those two-part chords and interpreting them? I'm such a dense harmony addict, and I can't imagine flying without the net of a chord symbol. That's a great question, Charles, and that's exactly what I was talking about, what I learned from listening to these classical composers, because same here as a pianist, you know, you always want your chord symbol, and then you can come up with a five or six part chord. and you know, if, if you work with five, six parts, you can almost connect any chord with voice leading because you can always go somewhere close. Like you can almost make anything work. Reducing to this really sparse two-part structure really requires you to, to think about uh, about voice leading and really get rid of that of, of that safety net. And it pushes you to, to write different stuff, to, to go in different directions. And interpreting them, yeah, that's that's a difficult part. Sometimes I, I try it out a lot. I kind of... I play them in a blow over them. I try different scales and then try to find what's closest to the sound I hear. I'd often when I compose, my challenge is to find on the instrument what I'm hearing in my head. I often have a sound mm -hmm. in my head and I'm not always able to immediately find what it is. That's a lot of the process of composing for me to kind of find what it is. And especially with these two part chords, there's a lot of experimenting, playing, trying out different different scales, doing little test improv improvisations, and then kind of settle on on a chord. And sometimes, you know, maybe sometimes it's better to just give the musician the, the two-part chords, as I did in, in first spring. There's, uh, sorry, in uh, winter and June, there's no chord symbols in that part. And then everyone can make their own interpretations. When composing, do you find yourself beginning with a monologic or harmonic idea, or does it begin with improvising at the piano? All of the above, I would say. I, I try to, I try to start pieces in different ways, not always the same way. Um, sometimes it's a melodic idea, sometimes harmonic, or sometimes yeah, I just sit down and play until I find something that that sparks my interest. That I think, oh, I could do something with that. I also try to write off the instrument. Sometimes uh, rhythmic ideas can be great starting points as well, or textural ideas. So. Generally, I would recommend to to have a, a range of different ways of starting a piece because it gives you different results. We are flashing back to the good old days of 2008. Um, this is a lot. The tracks I picked today are mostly from uh, the year I did sort of an honor band thing in the Lower Mainland, um, but it's also the 
beginning of me being serious about big band, thinking about writing for big band, really sort of falling in love with the format. Uh, I had played in big bands for a little while before this. I was starting to get out into the scene, but making it into this program, uh, which is the high school jazz intensive at the Vancouver International Jazz Festival. Um, mm -hmm. That was super key to my development. It was my introduction to Nicole Mitchell, who is a Chicago based. Yes. Lotus. Yeah, she's amazing. Um, and just like, uh, like an incredible player an incredible musical mind and such a really just genuine warm person to be around um so oh, that's awesome. most of the pieces you're going to hear today are actually pieces that she introduced to me and i'll talk a little <laughs> bit more as we go through about uh some of the connections that just how this all sort of connects together <laughs> You mentioned Bomb Shelter Beast opened your eyes to techniques you found exciting. How did you take interesting elements of a piece and how do they become a part of your writing? When it comes to incorporating techniques from pieces I like, part of the reason they work is context. So one of the things that I'll listen to a piece for is like, why is a semitone crunch at this particular moment, on, on the end of three in bar 18, why does that give me this sort of particular emotion? Is it because it came from a really consonant sounding chord and led to something dissonant? Is it the interval and the fact that they're shorter stabs? Um, one of the things with Bomb Shelter that's really cool actually is just the incorporation of like uh, the, the air horn, the shredding electric guitar, the like all of these elements that make it feel like sort of chaotic without necessarily being chaotic elements themselves um like the idea of improvising over backgrounds is nothing new but the idea of improvising over backgrounds that are maybe more percussive short stabs longer stabs uh not having a ton of stuff going on in the background in terms of melody per se and letting guitarists sort of take that um that's uh one way i'm sort of looking at a piece when i'm thinking of uh what the element I'm trying to replicate is, that's also really important. It's like, do I want to find a place to use this semitone cluster because I think semitone clusters are cool? Or am I trying to create an energy of like tension or anxiety? And maybe semitones are a way to realize that. So uh, that could sound a little confusing. I guess what I'm trying to say is what I'm looking for is like the context of the thing that I'm analyzing and why it works. And then I'm trying to see what I'm, doing with the piece that I'm working on or like what I want to take away from that. Is it the general mood? Is it the specific device? Is it something sort of in the middle, like the general movement of harmony, but maybe in a different key or maybe with a different function? Um, there's definitely stuff I listen to where I'm like, oh, that shift from minor to major is really impactful. Um, how can I work in a similar shift from minor to major? Is it the actual distance between the two notes that matters, the interval of transposition? Or is it just the idea of like going a step around the circle of fifths? Um, so yeah, I guess the short answer there is uh, figure out why, why it works and then figure out what you want to take from it. 